In view of the internet censorship and the way we're losing our library, our global library as James Corbett puts it, I would like to go back a few years and show folks that I've been pushing the song of saving hard copies for a real long time. I began saving old books somewhere around 18 years ago, I think, when I started to realize there was something fishy going on with the way I didn't like the way they were slowly propagandizing everything. And the movie 1984, I think, was part of the inspiration that drove me into a very serious new level of that hard copy saving aspect of my life. I have quite a few old books. And of course, as most of you know, I've done a lot of work in pushing the DVD ministry, uh, making sure that people have hard copies of a lot of the most important things we're going through in these recent years. Uh, but just to show you folks that, yes, this is extremely important in various biblical forms as well, in our ability to maintain a solid understanding of what Scripture tells us, where a lot of us are used to going to things like Esword uh, or the strong definitions or concordances. A lot of these references that we use normally on a routine day-to-day -day basis, I discovered some years back, have some very serious problems. Of course, I had a couple of different aspects in several different shows. And what I'm going to do is combine them all into one video here, and I'll try to patch in a few images as I can, uh, although I don't want to put a lot of time into this one because a lot of you have already heard this material. But this is for some of the newbies, some of the new uh, conspiracy theorists out there that are waking up uh, who are following Scripture. Please know that there's a lot of the modern reference books you're using that are absolutely to be watched very carefully, scrutinized with a very fine-toothed comb, because what you'll hear in the upcoming, oh, shall I say, 45 minutes or so. So hang in there, and uh, I'll start off with a show we did in May of 2017, where I started seeing things in a much more evidential way about how they are changing things on us. So take a listen to this one and, and well, just it, it'll explain itself. This is May 2017. The Father works in crazy ways sometimes. But I was looking something up here uh, one day this week, and I remembered having been in the Strongs several times and being disappointed. And so, I had another instance of that again this week where I said, you know, I just don't feel comfortable with the Strongs. It doesn't seem like it's on the up and up. And I said, I'm going to do some research. And so I did. I started doing some research years ago. But boy, when I, I hit this particular vein of information, a lot more puzzle pieces fell into place. And wow, I was just amazed. I was very excited to see what I saw, confirming again, yet again, that my conscience and my heart was telling me something that I really uh, knew deep down there was a problem with. And it just it, it's amazing how the Father just seems to put things in my heart, even before I see them in print or in evidence form. And it, it's amazing how this works. But let me get to you some of the uh, things that took place. I was looking up some different passages here this week, and I can't remember which one it was that I saw a, a difference of opinion on it in the Strongs, and I just, re, I, my mind went back to some years ago when I was looking up the word kingdom, and the Strongs had an unusual phrase in its definition for the word kingdom, and of course its Greek word uh, is basileia, if you want to try to remember that. The Greek word for kingdom is Basileia. Uh, and the Strong's translates this. Uh, Roman numeral one, royal power, kingship, dominion, rule. Which, okay, that sounds good. But under that, there are three subcategories, A, B, and C. A, not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom. Oh, wow, that's kind of interesting. How can there be a kingdom and a non-kingdom? I started thinking about that some years back when I saw that. And I started thinking, something's not right here. How could you have a kingdom and not have a kingdom? Uh, it just didn't make sense to me. It almost sounded like they were trying to remove some of the true 
kingship of my true Father in heaven and the Messiah. Well, then you go to B and it says, of the royal power of Jesus as the triumphant Messiah. See, of the royal power and dignity conferred on Christians in the Messiah's kingdom. Roman numeral two, a kingdom, the territory subject to the rule of a king. Roman numeral three, used in the New Testament to refer to the reign of the Messiah. And that's all the Strong's had. Now, I said, just because it had that one phrase, though, not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom. As though, yes, he's trying to get you to think, just heavenly kingdom, not a real one on earth. I mean, what kind of mumbo jumbo is that? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Hmm. And so I started thinking, something's not right about this. How could there be such a dichotomy there? It didn't make sense to me. It's like saying, you have a car, but it's not really a car. It's only a car if it's in heaven. Wait a minute. All right, you have a, you have a, a, a Bible. It's not really a Bible here on earth. It's just a Bible in heaven. You have a kingdom. It's not to be confused with a real kingdom. It's, it's just an imaginary kingdom in heaven is kind of the way I felt this guy was putting a definition for that. It doesn't make sense. If you're the president of a country, uh, don't you preside over that country? If you're a king of kings, you have a kingdom. If you don't have a kingdom, how can you be a king? It's mumbo jumbo. And I, I, all I can say to you folks is, I don't know who I'll bit on this, but it doesn't make any sense to me. I've studied enough law and, and English grammar and other languages. This is definitely a an intentional twist, in my opinion. But I thought, well, okay, it's not the, the overall definition. It was a subcategory. But because it was such a prominent subcategory, it probably does distract a lot of people from the true real meaning. So... Back then, I did go to the Thayers, and I still have the hard copy, and it's actually a copy from 1889, so I, I felt it was pretty trustworthy. So I, I have been using the Thayers more often than the Strongs, largely because I, of that very thing, and I didn't understand exactly why. Well, here this week, I did some research, and I, I looked up some of the different things about the author of the Strongs, James Strong, and... It turns out that he was a student, studied at Wesleyan University in 1844. Well, here's some other interesting things. Of course, he was a student with the Methodist layman. He was raised Methodist, according to this. He was then president of Troy University. Then he was a part of the faculty at Drew University. He was a chair of exegetical theology in 1868. It starts getting interesting here when we go back to his personal history, though. Before he was president of Troy University, which was a university he began, which kind of in, was interesting, it was very short-lived, it didn't survive. But he, after he finished studying at Wesleyan in 1844, he organized a railroad company and built an entire line. He was also a mayor in a large city in Long Island, New York. Wow. And then he went on to found a university and became very prominent at the faculties of Drew University. And, hmm, I started thinking. Well, then I read some of the actual glowing reviews of this man by those who really like this fella on some other websites, and one website had a really wonderful quote. It says, quote, James Strong, he worked with energy and persistence to win for Methodist laymen a voice in the government of the church. And when victory was won and laymen took their seats in the General Conference of 1872, the Newark Conference elected him as one of its first lay delegates. Well, guess what, folks? Understand that it's about that time, shortly thereafter, that there came a book out of that lay delicate called the United Methodist Book of Discipline. Hmm. Which today is about as large as the Bible itself. Full 
of man-made laws. Well, let's start from the beginning. He was a Methodist, layman. He was a part of the church. He studied at Wesleyan University, which was, of course, we know uh, Wesley was the guy that founded the Methodist church. But he studied at Wesleyan, and then he gets out. What's the first thing he does? He starts a railroad company. This is back during the very time when railroad tycoons were really making huge money. Okay? If you wanted a get-rich-quick scheme, and you thought you had the power to get started in it, that would be the thing to do. That's when uh, the, the Rothschilds and all the big bankers, they were all getting into the railroads because that was where a lot of money was. Railroads and oil. Now, in 1844, he gets out of the Western University, organizes this railroad company, builds an entire railroad line. He's then a mayor in a city on Long Island. Well, so he's got two interesting things. He's a railroad tycoon, a big business guy. And he's also in politics. Well, right off the bat, I'm thinking something's not fitting real well here with me. But then that quote, he worked with energy and persistence to win for Methodist laymen a voice in the government of the church. A voice for government in the church. Why? Didn't the church have its own government based on the Bible? Hmm. Well, and when victory was won... And laymen took their seats in the General Conference of 1872. In other words, men started sitting in a conference to sit and start replacing what? The Father's authority. The Newark Conference elected him as one of its first lay delegates. Of course, shortly thereafter, we see the appearance of the United Methodist Book of Discipline, of which I have a copy from 1968, just happened to have one. So I I looked this book up, and it's quite interesting as well. But you look at this book, and I have this copy here right in front of me. And it's, let's see, 587 pages in length. It's a big book. All right? And, I mean, it's it's small type, and it's, it's really chock full of tons and tons of text. I mean, it's no little bitty book. So it's a big book sort of like a, the size of a Bible. And the copy I have is 1968. And I think I have other copies too somewhere in my library, but I'm not sure. I just happened to grab this one today because I had footnotes marked in it. And I wanted to get to the footnotes real quick that I read through years ago. And wait till you hear some of these. Now, this is, the, this is what came of the fellow who began Strong's Concordance and the Strong's Dictionary for, okay, Now, in the Episcopal greetings in the very first opening prologue of this book, they speak of change, admitting a need to be flexible to serve the immediate demands of humanity in our time. And if you look at it, it basically, I don't want to read this whole one, but it it does say, these conditions and circumstances have dictated successive and continuing emphasis and expeditions demanding imagination and dedication in education, missionary expansion, social and economic justice, international peace, ecumenical experiment, interracial relations, and the use and misuse of vast and growing national power. Hmm. Our response to all these situations, given our commitment to Christ as Lord, has been reflected in our successive disciplines. Now, the word Christ our Lord in this paragraph is the only place in this entire book that I basically see him mentioned with any honor. The rest of the book, I went through it pretty well, looking page by page. When I first got this, and I, I uh, it's dog-eared, there's probably about 40 different post-it notes at the top of this uh, book, sticking up from front to back. I went through the whole thing looking, and at the back it says, nowhere did I find a single scriptural passage. United Methodist Book of Discipline. Okay? Not a single scriptural passage. So you get the idea. And what I'm saying to you is maybe, maybe a railroad tycoon politician somehow had a hand in destroying the United Methodist Church after John Wesley had started it in such a wonderful way. Hmm. 
All right, that's just one. Now, if that's the case, and James Strong has other issues, which gives me the incentive to think, using my imagination, that it was a clever way for the other side to find another way to distract people from the Bible itself by being able to make changes from another book, from, an, from, an, from outside, if you will. But I went online and went to some other areas. And when you do read the Thayers on that same word, uh, Basileia, which is kingdom, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, I go to both the online version and the uh, 1889, and they never changed. Joseph Henry Thayer, Honorable Dublin Professor of New Testament Criticism and Interpretation, the Divinity School of Harvard University. Uh, and this is the one I have. Like I say, it's an, an 1889 version. But if you remember, the dates aren't that far off. 1868 was when he basically put together the, the Drew University. And shortly thereafter is when he came out with the, uh, the concordance. Now, here we are in 1889. Uh, not that far after that, a fellow has one that I think is a lot more accurate. Now, if you look at the Thayer's definition for that same word, it's not just a few lines like Strong's did, but it's, it's several pages of definitions. And nowhere in there does he say not to be confused with a real kingdom. In fact, if I could give you one or two examples here of this, uh, the kingdom of the Messiah, which will be founded by God through the Messiah and over which the Messiah will preside as God's vice regent. Very frequently, the kingdom, which is of heavenly or divine origin and nature, uh, here we are, um, of the royal power of Jesus, of the triumphal Messiah, relying principally on the prophecies of Daniel, who had declared it to be the purpose of God that after four vast and mighty kingdoms had succeeded one another, and the last of them shown itself hostile to the people of God, at length its despotism should be broken, and the empire of the world pass over forever to the holy people of God. And he gives all the scripture references, left and right here. I mean, there's tons of them in the Thayers. The Jews were expecting a kingdom of the greatest felicity, which God, through the Messiah, would set up, raising the dead to life again and re renovating earth and heaven, and that in this kingdom they would bear away forever over all the nations of the world. This kingdom was called the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of the Messiah, and in this sense must these terms be understood. In the utterances of the Jews and of the disciples of Jesus when conversing with him, but Jesus employed the phrase kingdom of God or of heaven to indicate that perfect order of things which he was about to establish in which all those of every nation who should believe in him were to be gathered together into one society, dedicated and intimately united to God and made partakers of eternal salvation. This kingdom is spoken of as now begun and actually present. This is Thayer's. Okay? It's actually present in as much as its foundations have already been laid by Christ and its benefits realized among men that believe in him. And he goes on and on with great wonderful feelings. I mean, now, I don't want to go and belabor this point with a whole lot of evidences here and examples there. Uh, I did do a lot of digging in my old uh, lexicons, my old uh, language books that I had in my old library, and I pulled some of them out and brought them down here to the office area I have. And I have found that the more I dig, the more I realize there's really something wrong with the Strongs. Now, if I were a man to speculate, I could actually really uh, step forward and probably find a lot of evidence to stand up and simply say that I believe Strong might have been controlled opposition. Maybe he was even a Jesuit. I don't know that part. But for some reason... There's too many coincidences that all fit together with his very big power, his political stance, his railroad tycoon background, and some of the schools he tried to begin. Was he really trying to outdo everyone else to get everybody away from believing that maybe the Puritans were right, that we needed a kingdom under the Father? The Strongs, with just that word kingdom, and I'm sure if we look at other ones, we'll find a lot of other ones that take away the authority and law of the Father in civil ways. The Strongs may have been one of the biggest things that, that destroyed that image 
since the 1800s. Because people just automatically assume they could trust the Strongs because all the other references in the Strongs are okay. It's only when you get to the point where you get dominionist issues, the Strongs turns an about face with it. So I'm pretty confident that I can say with some evidential backing that I don't think I want to use Strongs from here on out unless I have no other resource or if it's a word that's not that critical. If I want to look up the word for cattle or something, okay, I'm not going to worry about that one. But anything that has any intrinsic value with understanding the authority of my father or anything that has to do with salvation and the, the Messiah's truth over us. But I, I have nothing in my heart at this moment that tells me that I can feel comfortable with James Strong. So to sum this up, the more we obey the Father, the more we stand in His trust, trusting in Him and Him alone, the more the rest of the passages of the Bible come to life. Again, the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, John 16, 13, and the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey him, Acts 5, 32. Now, technically, we shouldn't really be going into these man-made dictionaries as much as we are anyway. We should be seeking the Father's pleasure in us by obeying him and becoming uh, as dear children, that he would share his intimacy with us, his instruction through the Holy Spirit, the right way. Uh, although, until we get to those higher levels, yes, uh, it's good to study to show ourselves approved, to see how man has, some some men have intentionally drawn us away, while others have been trying very hard to do the right things and reform us. So as we study these things, we grow. We grow in wisdom and knowledge, but the Holy Spirit is the ultimate teacher that we're to be looking for. He's only given to those that obey the Father. Just keep that in mind now. So the more we obey him on the things that we can see clearly in black and white in the scriptures, the more we're going to get blessed left and right with the other details, the, the, the more complicated stuff that's there. You've got these people in these churches. They're doing Christmas. They're doing Easter. They're, they're, they're following the, the Gregorian calendar. They're using the old uh, names, God and Lord, instead of the true sacred names like Yahweh and Yeshua. They're, they're, they're doing everything upside down. And, and then they want to argue with us that they think they have a better interpretation of the Bible than we do. Well, I mean, can you see why they're having trouble? They're not obeying, especially the, the churches that, that deny that the, the law is still valid. They, they say the law is dead. There's no way I can see the Father being gracious to them with his deeper secrets, just like a general would not give the deeper uh, battle secrets to the goof-offs in the force. Right? He'd give it to his most trusted people. His right hand men might get those secrets, but not, not Joe Schmo who might run off and tell somebody else on the other side of the fence. My picture of this whole thing is real simple. And I've seen it this way since I was a teenager. The more you obey the Father, the more you show him your respect for his wisdom and his, his knowledge, the more he realizes how you truly want to be like him. And that's where it gets into what I was talking about just yesterday with, uh, you know, a respect for our Father, the fifth commandment, uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, you know, uh, children obey your parents in the Lord. Uh, we are trying, like the song, Cats and the Creator, I want, someday I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. You guys know that song. If I wanted to be like my own father, my mortal father, and always admired him. Now, of course, uh, that always comes to a, a point in our lives where, you know, a mortal father can only, you can only go so high and, and honor your mortal father, uh, and, and wanting to, uh, emulate him. But your heavenly father, I can't wait to be everything like him. We're to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord, right? Perfect holiness in the fear of God. And we're supposed to do all we can to emulate him. You know, perfecting holiness in the fear of Yahweh. It says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. The image he gives us with the fifth commandment in Ephesians 6 is to study, to show ourselves approved in a way that we we reach out and we obey and honor our family uh, heads. If, if, of course, there's not a father in the family and, and the father's died or something, you obey the mother if you're a child. At the same time, though, that's just the example for the child. The child and the parents then should turn together 
and and honor and obey the Father in heaven. That's the example. Having said that and moved that in there on us, realizing it's because the Father is the true overall king. He has a kingdom. A kingdom that we've just shown here today is not according to rich railroad tycoons and politicians, but a kingdom according to those who shortly thereafter saw that bad definition and made corrections so that hopefully folks like you and I would have looked for the better uh, Greek dictionaries or Hebrew dictionaries, whichever we needed at the moment, I should say. Now, it's upon us to also realize that why did the Strongs get so much more popular than the Thayers? Just as with anything else, it had a lot of money behind it. Why? Because the same reason the NIV got so popular, trying to replace the King James. But you know what? Those of us who love the Father, who have the Holy Spirit, don't want those cheap imitations. We don't want the cheap Bibles. We don't want the cheap uh, concordances. We don't want the cheap lexicons. Not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom. We want the Father's truth. Let me, let me bring up one more passage. Luke 22, 29. And I appoint unto you a kingdom. That's again that Greek number, G932. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. Kingdom, it's a government. Let me read G932 to you again. <gasps> but wait a minute. If I go to my electronic e-sword as I was the other morning to try and get a quick version because I wasn't near my actual books, I looked up the Thayer's definition of G932, and guess what I got? 1A, not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom. And I went, what? 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 That's the Strong's definition that we found was wrong. My Thayer's hard copy book from 100 years ago doesn't say that. As you folks will remember that from that study we did, is my older E sword corrupt now too? Now, it's possible that it was a computer glitch. I'm not going to say that they did it on purpose. The computer I was reading it out of, an E sword computer version, was installed in this computer probably about nine years ago. And it, this computer is not online. So, did the eSword nine years ago already have the corruption parts already placed in it to do the same thing we discovered in our strong study? That they're slowly trying to get us away from believing that a kingdom is truly a government and that the Father should be in charge? They're slowly, slowly changing things on us, which is why it was so important to hold on to the old books that we had years ago. But people say, oh, that's old. We could get a new copy online. Sorry, that's not working very well today. Now, I would like some of you folks out there to let me know what G932 reads in your e-sword for both the Strongs and the Thayers. And let me know if your Thayer definition has the long two or three page definition of a true government that is, is what the kingdom really means, as we talked about. And I gave you some examples of a couple weeks back. Or if your e-sword has also been corrupted and has the Strong's definition stuck in there where the Thayers used to be. This blew my mind as well. Which does what to Luke twenty two twenty nine, And I appoint unto you a kingdom, G932, as my Father hath appointed unto me. Well, if you go by the original Thayers, it says it's talking about a real kingdom. It's, it's going to be here someday on earth as soon as we get our act together and we initiate it. And the pilgrims were trying to do that. The apostles tried to do that, which is why the, the Caesars wanted to squash the Christians because Christ was basically setting up a situation where, okay, if everybody gets together, we can overthrow the Caesarian government and we can get a true biblical government back in place. And so that's why people were selling their homes and laying it at the feet of the apostles. They knew they could get the tyranny stopped if they could get the Father's kingdom put back in place. So they're selling their homes, giving it to the apostles and saying, all right, here, 
Now, here's everything we own. Let, let's get this kingdom started. You don't get that preached to you in the 501c3 churches, do you? No. They don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. They give you all kinds of other academic uh, lessons all around that, but they won't tell you what was really going on, that that's why the, the, the people of that time were flocking to become Christians because they knew if they hurried up and got enough of them together, there's no way that Rome, the Roman Empire, could have continued to grow in, a, in the tyrannical form that it was becoming over them if they if they got together and they all really joined forces. There were a lot more of them back then who were very courageous. We are not doing so well. We're very complacent. We're very, very cowardly in this nation right now. And folks, I've said it many times. When truth prevails, love is the reward. It's real simple. We have to go by the truth and we have to understand that there's only one way out of this world. It's through love. The world wants us to leave this world through evil and wickedness, making them money and, or, or supplying their lusts. But the Father says, no, you know, trust in me. Let's go by love. And that's what we need to do. A government, a kingdom built on love. A kingdom that, yes, does exist. It is to be confused very easily with Father's real kingdom. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer. So yes, they're going to be tied directly together. So I'm sorry, Mr. James Strong, but I'm going to confuse them. You know why? Because they're one and the same. Thank you for listening. And uh, we'll open the lines again. And uh, we'll talk to you in a few moments. All good things are down. And the times are great. I've been on my walk with my Lord Yahweh. We'll be safe from harm. On Yahweh's wrathful day. On Yahweh's wrathful day. I'm sorry, what's that? That was good information. Oh, okay. You think yes. it, was, it was helpful then for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well... Name of that book, the, Meth the, the what Methodist? Um. It's actually the title is the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church. Now, almost every church has these, though. It's not just United Methodist. The Episcopals have them. The the the, the, the Lutherans have a book like these now. Everyone has their own what they call bylaws. Well, yeah, you know when you were when you were throwing out quotes from that, all I could think of was that. Lutheran thing that I had downloaded a couple yeah. days ago, mm -hmm. and it's classic Jesuit learning against learning. Yes, exactly. And throwing philosophical humanist ideas into these these books that define how these churches are going to run. Mm -hmm. That's right. But yeah, just the whole idea of liking... Um, the way the Catholic Church defines things should have been a huge right. you know, alarm going off for people. What a red flag that should have been, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, while you were talking, I tried looking him up strong in my um, website where I have the ancestry stuff. Yeah. And he's not in there. <laughs> Which is interesting because usually people that are famous get put in there and they have a, a profile that's controlled by the um, the website itself. They have like a they have a curator controlling their uh, profile, uh -huh. like all the kings and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was going to see if he had a royal line in there because he was made mayor of a a, a, a city on Long Island, and you don't become mayor in New York State unless you have Catholic in high places. And Catholic ties, too, probably, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, if you want to dig further, dig dig, dig further, that's great. But this is, this is the kind of stuff that, that, that they're in trouble with because they can't hide everything. And 
especially like you know they 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 incrementally hide things from us but they can only hide you know so many layers uh and they can only hide so many copies of things and when we start finding stuff like this and start seeing straight out how you know the strongs is sort of like the modern day niv in the concordance world so you see the background of the guy that puts it together and right there the book of Me the book of discipline shows up on the scene and everything else it's it's real clear the guy the guy brought everybody together come on let's 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 make our traditions more important than the bible in our church forget john wesley let's do it our way and it's almost a, when he had victory you heard the quote i don't know it's it's sad but this is how all the churches were corrupt. They, slowly but surely, they would infil they were infiltrated by people just like this. It seems like there's no true church anymore. Right, you're right, Stephanie. Right, they're, they're very they're, the only true church are the folks like ourselves on these kind of calls all over the world. There's just a few people like us around the world. Yes, it, it's so sad because so many people are being so deceived and they don't even know it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's you know, sad. I mean, it's sad because I, you know, I look at it and I think, how sad. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. it's, well, I can say, Dwayne, since downloading eSword, um, I think it's been about a year now that I've had that. And when I've been looking up definitions, I, I was thinking, you know, when I'm going back and forth between Webster's, Thayer's, and Strong's in another dictionary, I'm like, wow, it's like there's so many different definitions here. And it didn't even occur to me that one of them might be corrupt. Yeah. Um, it took me a couple of years to figure it out myself. But like I said, it started with me about six, seven years ago. But I'd never had actual evidence of it until this week on the Strong's issue. Although I... I I think I might have even mentioned it to you when you were downloading your eSword, uh, when, I, when I showed you what eSword was all about, well, about a year ago, I guess it was now, and, and I told you that I, I uh, that, that, you know, you get the Strongs, but I, I think I told you at that time I, I preferred the Thayers. I don't know if I, if you remember me saying that or not. Yeah, well, the only hard copy dictionary I have is Strongs, mm -hmm. so I guess I can throw that out. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't throw it out. I still refer to it from time to time. Uh, you never know when you're going to need a, uh, there might be a reason to go to the Strongs. Like somebody might refer you to the Strongs and, and say, well, that's the right definition. And you might, if you threw it away, you might be able to say, well, here's what Thayer says and here's what Strong says. You might not be able to verify what they're even saying. They might, yes, I understand what you're yeah. saying. Um, I always hold on. I, that's why I have my wall of shame in my library. All the things that I know are corrupt, I, they're all kept on one wall in case I ever need them. Okay, folks, well, back to 2020 for a quick note. I just want to let everyone know, yes, we're losing the Internet as far as truth goes. Honesty, integrity. What I would propose to you is continue to try and find good platforms if you must go there. But I will say that the Internet is essentially, presently, and it may change for the good in the, in the long run if we do this properly, all the world is going to the Internet as though it's their first choice for knowledge and truth in this world, hoping, above all hope, that they'll find the needle in the haystack they're looking for that guides them to the exact truth. What I would say to you is the Bible should be our first choice. The Holy Spirit, if we're obedient, is our second choice. The Internet would be maybe a third choice at best, aside from maybe some that we trust who also have the Father's Spirit. I've had a lot of people confront me in recent times, and I would just like to say, folks, the internet is the first choice of the heathen and the lukewarm. I have intentionally moved myself away from the internet, as many of you know, and I've been working really hard at trying to get hard copies out of what I have found through scripture from the Father's ways of instructing us to find knowledge in bringing truth to those who want it. I have been extremely successful in doing something that we've lost touch with in this world, which is to go ye out unto all the world, preaching the gospel unto every creature, preaching the kingdom, the government of a loving God who can stop all of this. If we were obedient enough to walk away from this beast system altogether, trust in him, his book, his scriptures, his knowledge, push the internet and all of its other things aside for the moment and trust in him. Folks, my advice to all of you, 
get back to the ways of Scripture and what the Messiah himself taught, that we're to personally go out and talk to people, one-on-one, one-on-two, or gather crowds if you can. Take that stupid mask off so they could see your smile, they could see your expressions. Don't deny yourself the opportunity to get close to people again. This is exactly what Satan wants. He wants us all far apart, far removed from one another, on internets, emails, everything else. Satan does not want us talking to one another face-to-face like we used to do for thousands of years. Bible first, obedience second to the things you read in that Bible. Things you have questions on, pray. And again, Proverbs 28, 9, He that turneth away his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. So you have to obey the law so the Father can look down upon you and give you more of that wisdom, that Holy Spirit guidance that guides us into all truth. Again, my two passages, John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, Acts 5, 32, the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey him. The Great Commission, which is to go yet unto all the world, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the government of Yahweh, is our first job. It's our commission as a true servant, as a true ambassador of this King of Kings that we say we love. If we really love him, we shouldn't be ashamed of him so much that we can't go out on the streets and talk to our neighbors. Folks, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not be wearing masks today, I guarantee you. Get out there and talk to your neighbors. Let them know you love them. Let them know you care enough about them that you're willing to risk your own rejections trying to reach them to tell them what you've found as truth in that wonderful book. I'll let you go for the day. Blessings to you all. I can't wait to see all of you in the resurrection when we can all be face to face without all the world wandering after the beast around us. Hallelujah. The Lord.